Good morning. I'm Dr. Ali Aburama, and I have here with me Dr. Enrico Asher and Dr. Malas from University of California. Um, today, we're going to be covering hot topics at VEATH meeting 2019, and that's TCAR, transcarotid revascularization. Where do we stand with TCAR today? Dr. Malas. Thank you, Ali. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the, the question first is why TCAR? So, so far we've been doing really amazing job with carotid endirectomy and carotid stenting was introduced to be minimally invasive option for patients who are high risk for endirectomy. But every single clinical trial showed a stroke rate twice as much with transfemoral stenting comparing to carotid endirectomy. So TCAR is this hybrid procedure that combine the best of two worlds, uh, endirectomy and stenting. It gives you CEA-like protection by going directly through the carotid artery and clamping the carotid artery. And the most recent evidence showing uh, uh, the lowest reported stroke ever uh, compared to any transfemoral stenting, uh, as low as one and a half percent. Dr. Asher, I know you have published and you have great experience in what we call mini incision carotid endarthrectomy, and you could do the procedure, clean the carotid artery without leaving a device behind. Give us your thought about would this replace mini incision carotid endarthrectomy? Yeah. Thank you, Ali. I think this is a great question and it's very, very uh, timely because carotid endarthrectomy was developed in the 50s, and since then, really not much has been done in terms of evolving the technique. In 2005, uh, actually in 2000, we felt that if we are to compete with uh, carotid stenting, uh, carotid endotrectomy has to change. And the first thing we did is we got a ultrasound machine and we identified the location of the carotid uh, bifurcation. So therefore, we could limit now the incision. We don't have to make an incision from the ear lobe down to the upper chest to find the carotid uh, bifurcation. So just using this simple maneuver, you can now limit your incision to about an inch, or a bit more than an inch, or a bit less than an inch, but an inch in average, and you can go to this area of the carotid artery and do the endotrectomy the standard way or with eversion endotrectomy, you have the options. We also use a very cheap way to see whether the patient needs a, stand, a uh, shunt or not. It just measure the back pressure, and this has been shown to be accurate over 2,000 cases. So by doing a small incision, which is almost the same size as the incision you do for TCAR, we can avoid the stent, makes the procedures cheaper and as, is a, as safe. Not that TCAR is not indicated in some patients. I think those who have a high lesion and those who will redo operations certainly would benefit much more with TCAR than any mini incision. Thank you, Dr. Asher. Uh, Dr. Melas, on the same token, listening to Dr. Asher, you are cleaning the artery with an incision close to almost similar to the incision of TCAR. So what do you think TCAR would offer if you do that type of approach and you don't leave any metal behind? I think if you can do carotid endorectomy with one inch, that's phenomenal. And not, not everybody as good as Dr. Asher. The, the reality is we see, you know, on average the incision at least two to three inches, and that's considered small. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people will have an incision that is much, uh, you know, longer. Uh, and uh, you still also, a majority of us do this procedure under general anesthesia. Uh, and that is one of the problem with carotid endorectomy is not the procedure itself, is the uh, sequelae of the anesthesia risk of MI. So I, I think, you know, carotid endorectomy is the gold standard is the way that to remove the plaque completely, the source of embolization. But TCAR, the more we see a, an outcome that is similar to carotid endirectomy uh, for the first time with stenting, and the fact that is, you can always do it with very small incision, mm -hmm. an inch, it, it's gonna be more and more uh, one of the, uh, the options available now for our patients. And I totally agree with Enrico. Uh, there are certain patients that definitely will benefit from stenting clearly with all the data, including also I um, might add the radiated neck and, and you know prior neck dissection and whatnot, where this clearly stenting is superior. We have been saying lately, well, the TCAR is almost as good as an endotrectomy. It's not, if it's not good 
or equal to, but aren't we probably comparing different type of population? In other words, I would like to hear from Dr. Malas, is there a select group of patients where TCAR work well, but there are select certain patients who really cannot be TCAR candidates? Yeah. Yeah. So the first part of the question, you're absolutely right. That's a very, very important point. So with the, uh, the TCAR surveillance project, which was sponsored by the SVS and the Vascular Quality Initiative, and it's a clinical trial approved by the FDA, uh, we uh, enroll every patient who had TCAR in this country, and we have data on all these patients, and these patients are extremely sick. So the people who are getting the TCAR are not similar to the people getting carotid endorectomy. All of them has to be high risk, whether it's medical high risk or anatomical high risk. And uh, these patients still having similar stroke and death rate compared to endorectomy, and uh, half the MI. So just to kind of emphasize the point that you're talking about as far as the patient. Now, anatomically, not everybody can get TCAR, so you have to have a healthy common carotid artery because you have to access the common carotid artery directly. And you have to also have a good diameter of the vessel, at least six millimeter. You have to have landing zone, which is the distance between the clavicle and the bifurcation to be at least five centimeter. Mm -hmm. So these are a specific, uh, you know, anatomical requirement for TCAR. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second more important thing about stenting in general, you know, we know that p there are certain lesions that don't do well at all with stenting. So if you have severely calcified atherosclerotic lesions, circumferential calcium, the thickness of the calcium is more than three or four millimeter, these people don't do well with any kind of stenting and endorectomy is the way to, to go with these patients. Professor Asher, what's, what's your thought on this point? I think they're very good questions and I don't think we have definitive answer because there haven't been done a study comparing mini incision carotid endotrectomy with TCAR. So, and I think that's what we need to, to think about, yeah. a prospective study comparing a much cheaper uh, technique, which is as effective in my mind, but I'm biased, um, versus one that's more expensive and that harbors a metal at the end of the day. So I think that that, that has to be answered with a prospective uh, study. But I think your point is that for, for TCAR, of course, you have to select. There's a lot of selection uh, uh, in the process that goes in, like Dr. Mala said. And I would assume that probably 20, 30 percent of the patients are not really candidates for TCAR. Mm -hmm. While uh, the patients that I think they're not candidates for mini incisions are only the ones that have a hostile neck. Mm -hmm. And those are probably less than 5 percent yeah. of the cases. So I think right there, you're going to have to use, perhaps you, you have to know both techniques. Yeah. I think they both would add to the armamentarium to the vascular surgeon. The concept of reversing flow is confusing to many clinical surgeons about how could you have reversal flow, which as you know, it average eight, nine, ten minutes. Knowing the fact, some people think there is no flow to the cerebral hemisphere of that side, and now we say the stroke rate is one or two percent. Do you think maybe that impact on their cognitive functions in the future? Yes, a very important question, and I think when, that's one of the uh, advantages of TCAR is that you're not stopping the blood flow. So even though you're clamping the carotid artery, you're actually allowing the blood to flow continuously through the contralateral carotid and through the vertebral artery through the circle of bullets. So, and this is why you have to have an eight French sheath. Uh, to allow enough channel to get the blood to flow re retrograde while you're doing the procedure. So first, you don't manipulate the lesion, you don't pass any wires without protection, so you have continuous protection throughout the procedure. Second, the blood is not, uh, is not stopping to the brain at all as it happened with carotid endorectomy when you clamp. So the blood is flowing, but instead of going anti-grade, it's going retrograde, and the tissue in the brain is being well perfused. And this is why what we're seeing is, you know, now, you know, to thousands of patients that less than 1% not able to tolerate this. And these are very few people who have like an M1 segment or any occlusion within the circle of in that area that they don't have enough con con uh, collateral flow from the anterior communicating, posterior communicating cerebral artery. Yeah. Dr. Asher, your thought about this I point? I also agree that's a very good point, except that uh, cognitive dysfunction can take years to show. It does not necessarily show on the spot. You may have somebody who talks normally right after the procedure and no, has no motor dysfunction, but yet has grave uh, cognitive dysfunction that may show uh, years down the line or months down the line usually. So unless we do a uh, 
a very good scientific study with cognitive testings before, during, I mean right after, and then down the line, perhaps in a year or two, we won't really know the, the answer. Mm -hmm. Because there's microembolization that can occur, although this technique, the idea of reversal is very attractive to me, actually something that was brought up by Parodi and his colleagues some time ago, and I think is a great, probably is the best way for protection uh, because when we shunt the patient, actually, we have a chance of embolizing during the procedure, creating some technical issues with it. So I think the reversal, act actually, a portion of this procedure is very attractive to me. On the same talking, since you said that's why we have the eight French Corat chief, and first time we have done this over two, three years ago, I have in the first few cases some difficulty getting that sheath in. And the principle was, as you suggested, to have a good reversal flow. Do you see in the future that being going down to six French, where we have reversal flow, but it's much friendly in putting yeah. that sheath in the common coronary artery? So uh, that, that is very important. So as yeah. you know, the stents now can be delivered with six French, and even five French some stents. But the problem is that in order to achieve this robust reversal flow, so all the uh, uh, testing that was done on this procedure uh, in, in research labs and, and bench models shows that in, in order to have an effective flow uh, reversal, you have to have at least eight French inner diameter. Now the sheath have dramatically improved and you can really deliver it and there's a few tricks you know, to dilate the opening and to have enough purchase with the wire that minimize the risk of problems of advancing the sheath. Okay, so it looked like we covered most of the um, good point that many clinicians raise in terms of T-car versus no T-car and so forth. Yeah. I think it looked like we got into answering many of the questions which goes around T-car. But today and November 21st, 2019, you had beloved person, mother, VIP, and they need a carotid intervention. What would you recommend for them feeling comfortable with that decision? And they fit, they can have any of these procedures. What would you recommend, Dr. Melas? I mean, I, I think, you know, first, um, you know, the, the most important thing about us as vascular surgeon is that we own that field and we know the pathology of, of carotid disease and we need to be expert in all different treatment management. I and, I, and I think, you know, the way I look at every patient, what would I do if it was my mom or my dad? That's how I make decisions. And I think the first thing if they're, you know, a lot of patients really don't need anything. They just need a good medical management statin and aspirin. We understand that. Yeah, and if they need the procedure and they're fit uh, medically, carotid endorectomy is the gold standard today. I mean, we have data for 60 years and we cannot just, based on 7,000 patients, change the way we do things. We need more studies, more trial before we can make such a leap. Uh, but the data so far, I think, you know, if, if my mother, and I know my mother is, have a lot of medical problems, yeah she will be better fit with stenting and absolutely will not be transfemoral stenting. It will be T-car. Yeah. Dr. Asher? Right. I will uh, send uh, that loved one to you or to Dr. Malas for carotid endotrectomy with a mini incision. Yeah. That's, that, that's a good I point. have no, 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 no doubts about it. Yeah, I understand your mother might have multiple medical mobility. I was trying to say you have someone who's healthy and can fit all these procedures, would you really do an endotrectomy? Of course, it's a great idea with mini incision by Dr. Asher, or would you still do carotid stent? I personally still today, I would go with the endotrectomies, but I do know we have a lot of patients in our practice who would be an ideal candidate for TCAR. Well, it is yeah. the gold standard. Yeah. And I mean, you cannot just do TCAR on people who are not high risk yes. because you have to do it under clinical trials. Yes. So the answer yes. is carotid endorectomy. Yes. Thank you very much for being with us today. And I hope we could learn more and more about this advanced technology in the carotid field. Thank you very much, Kai. Thank you. Thank you.